Congestive heart failure. One in every five Americans will develop heart failure. During your time in the hospital, this is a disease that you will see no matter where you work. Heart failure is classified into two main categories, systolic and diastolic heart failure. Diastolic heart failure is known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. In this video, we will be focusing on systolic heart failure. When examining systolic heart failure, about 70% are ischemic and 30% are non-ischemic. The word ischemic means inadequate blood supply, which results in inadequate oxygen supply, and therefore tissue death. Now let's look at the pathophysiology of systolic heart dysfunction. First you look at the normal functioning of the heart as it relates to cardiac output. Cardiac output means the amount of blood that is being pumped by the heart. In a normal heart, this reflects the normal cardiac output of the heart. When there is an ischemic injury, this is also known as myocardial infarction. The cardiac tissue will be weakened, which results in a decreased contractility of the myocardium, and therefore the cardiac output, or amount of blood being pumped by the heart, will be decreased. We can look closer at this by looking at the Frank-Starling's relationship, which shows us the relationship from stroke volume to preload. You usually see it in a graph like this. On the right, you'll see the word stroke volume, which represents the volume of blood pumped by the left ventricle per beat. Then on the bottom, you will see the word preload, which represents the initial stretching of the cardiac tissue prior to contraction. I like to think of preload as stretch and afterload as squeeze. This helps me remember. Preload is the end diastolic volume, which you may see abbreviated as EDV. Afterload is the pressure in the wall of the left ventricle during ejection. Cardiac output is the amount of blood volume ejected over a period of time. First let's look at the chart and then we will see a visual demonstration. Here you see a normal functioning heart. This heart has a normal preload and stroke volume. If the heart has injury, you will see something like this, a decrease in preload and stroke volume. In this visual demonstration of the heart, this part is demonstrating the preload and this is the stroke volume. You can see that the stroke volume of the heart increases in response to an increase in the volume of blood filling the heart, aka preload, which is also known as the end diastolic volume. For cardiac output, the other factor you need to know is the heart rate. Basically, the cardiac output is the stroke volume per heart rate. It looks like this. So think about it like this. Contractility is pumping, but the pump needs liquid to pump, which is volume. So whatever is pumped out is the output, also known as the afterload. This shows the stroke volume, which is the blood volume ejected over time. The relationship here is direct. The blood pressure is the peripheral blood pressure directly affected by the blood viscosity and the arterial diameter. All of this is dependent on the blood volume and the heart rate. Referring back to Frank's chart, here you can see a normal person's heart functioning with a healthy preload and stroke volume. This will equal good cardiac output. When the heart is injured and the preload is high, the greater the stretch, and therefore the greater the squeeze and resistance the heart must overcome to push the blood into the systemic circulation. So if the preload is high, the afterload will be high, and the cardiac output as well will be high. Okay, on the other hand, when the heart is injured, the preload will be low, the stroke volume will be low, and the cardiac output will be low as well. The lower cardiac output results in activation of, one, the sympathetic nervous system, and it also results in, two, decreased renal blood flow. So let's take a look at both of these. So first let's look at the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which activates the alpha and beta receptors by the decrease in cardiac output. The alpha and beta receptors are sensors located in the blood vessels. They sense the blood pressure and relay the information to the brain so that proper blood pressure can be maintained. So the alpha receptors equals constriction, which will bring more blood to the brain. And the beta receptors equal dilation, which will circulate blood to all of the organs. Here is an easy tool to help you remember this. Alpha constricts and beta dilates. 
Once the sympathetic nervous system is activated, it has three main effects. The first is activation of beta receptors. With activation of beta receptors, it increases the stroke volume and also the heart rate. This helps increase cardiac output for a while. However, eventually they cause damage to the heart, which can cause pulmonary congestion, hence left-sided heart failure. A tip to remember this is left-sided heart failure equals lungs. Just as a side note, this is why the medication beta blockers are given. These medications block the beta receptors, this slows down the heart rate and increases the stroke volume, ultimately stopping the damage from being done to the heart. The second effect of the sympathetic nervous system is the activation of alpha receptors. When the alpha receptors are activated, this leads to an increase in blood pressure from blood vessel constriction, which can also be thought of as afterload. This increase in afterload, also known as blood pressure, can further lower cardiac output. Just as a side note, this is why alpha blockers are given to block the constriction, thus inhibiting the elevation in blood pressure. The third effect that happens with the sympathetic nervous system is an increase in sodium retention, which then leads to fluid volume overload. When the fluid retention accumulates, it further worsens cardiac fusion, causing an increase in congestion, which equals cardiac toxicity due to the increase in oxygen demand from the body, hence right-sided heart failure and acute hemodynamic state as evidenced by all of these signs and symptoms. A tip to remember this is R equals the rest of the body. So now let's look at the effects of decreased renal perfusion to the kidneys. So when kidney perfusion is decreased caused by low cardiac output, this leads to an increase in aldosterone production. This increase in renin production leads to an increase in angiotensin 1, which will convert to angiotensin 2 with help of the ACE enzyme. The final effect of angiotensin 2 is a raise in the blood pressure or afterload, which can further decrease cardiac output, which may eventually lead to a further decrease in renal perfusion. The second effect of angiotensin 2 is an increase in aldosterone production, which leads to an increase in sodium and fluid retention, therefore causing decreased urine output. Urine output must be greater than 30 milliliters per hour in order to maintain adequate renal perfusion. Looking again at the Frank Starling's graph to understand that these changes due to preload and stroke volume in the setting of CHF. So remember, both the sympathetic activation and decreased renal perfusion, both of these lead to increased fluid retention. This eventually can lead to pulmonary congestion, which means backup of fluid in the lungs, and then further lead back up to fluid in other areas of the lungs because of an increase in stroke volume by an increase in preload. Let's break it down because this is important. An increase in stroke volume means too much fluid, and an increase in preload means that there is too much stretching, and the ventricles are being filled with too much fluid. In this condition, the heart can no longer pump enough oxygen-rich blood to the body, and is thus known as congestive heart failure. Welcome to the module on congestive heart failure. I'm Ben Morrison from the Division of Cardiovascular Disease, and I'll be taking you through this module. Epidemiology. Let's keep this part simple. Just know that congestive heart failure is common. There are 6.6 .6 million people in the U.S. with heart failure, and over 23 million worldwide. As a result of this, during your time on the wards, in residency, and beyond, you will end up caring for patients with congestive heart failure no matter what specialty of medicine you choose. So you better pay attention. Etiology. So to be able to talk about etiologies of heart failure, we must first talk about how to categorize heart failure into main categories. So to start off with, we generally group heart failure into two main categories systolic and diastolic heart failure. Diastolic heart failure is also known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. For the purposes of this module, we will be focusing primarily on systolic heart failure. With regard to etiologies of systolic heart failure specifically, 
There's about two thirds of the cases are related to ischemic cardiac disease, such as myocardial infarction or chronic coronary ischemia, or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. There are many causes of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and a full discussion of these is beyond the scope of this module. Some of the many causes are listed here. Pathophysiology. Let's talk about the pathophysiology of congestive heart failure, starting with the normal heart going along and pumping normally, and the measurement of the blood the heart pumps is the cardiac output. The first instigating event in the pathophysiology of congestive heart failure is an insult to the heart. Now this may be a myocardial infarction, an episode of viral myocarditis, or some form of infiltrative disease that results in weakening, weakening of the heart muscle and decrease in contractility, which is then manifested by a decrease in cardiac output. We can look closer at this by looking at the Frank-Starling relationship, which shows us the relationship of stroke volume to preload. And we start with the first blue curve, which is a normal heart, and someone at point A on that curve. And then if you look at the red curve, this is the heart after insult. So for every point of preload, you have a lower stroke volume. So at a given preload, this person moves from point A on the blue curve to point B on the red curve, which manifests as a lower cardiac output. As a result of the lower cardiac output, you have activation of the sympathetic nervous system, as well as decrease in renal blood flow, and we'll examine both of these closer. So let's start by talking about the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. A decrease in cardiac output leads to activation of baroreceptors, which then leads to increased activation of the sympathetic nervous system. The increase in activation of the sympathetic nervous system has three main effects that are important in, car in congestive heart failure. First is activation of beta receptors. Activation of beta receptors leads to increased stroke volume as well as increased heart rate. Both of these serve to maintain cardiac output. However, in the pathologic state of congestive heart failure, further increases in heart rate and further work on the heart may cause further myocardial damage, which can therefore further exacerbate the problem of decreased cardiac output. The second thing that happens with the sympathetic nervous system is increased sodium retention, thereby increasing fluid retention and leading eventually to volume overload. The third effect of the sympathetic nervous system important in the pathophysiology of congestive heart failure is activation of alpha receptors. Activation of alpha receptors leads to increased blood pressure, which can also be thought of as afterload. And this increase in blood pressure or afterload can further depress cardiac output, causing a vicious cycle. So now let's talk about the effects of decreased renal perfusion in the kidney. So when renal perfusion is decreased in the setting of low cardiac output, this leads to an increase in renin production. The increase in renin production then leads to an increase in angiotensin 1, and then after conversion by the ACE enzyme, leads to an increase in angiotensin 2. And then the end organ effects of angiotensin 2 lead to increased blood pressure or afterload, which can further decrease cardiac output, which can then lead to further decrease in renal perfusion. The second effect of angiotensin 2 is to lead to increased aldosterone production which then leads to increased sodium and fluid retention. We will come back to these flow charts when we talk about therapy as they will help understand why we use many of the medications we use to treat heart failure. Now we'll look again at the Frank Starling curve to understand what these changes in the pathophysiology of heart failure do to the effects of preload and stroke volume in the setting of congestive heart failure. So as you've heard in both the issues of sympathetic activation as well as decreased renal perfusion, both of these in the end lead to increased fluid retention. 
this increase in preload leads to a shift from point B on the red curve to point C, thereby increasing stroke volume by increasing preload. So again, you increase preload and you increase stroke volume. However, this comes at the expense of elevated filling pressures and as a result, pulmonary congestion. We can nicely sum up all of the pathophysiology of congestive heart failure in one simple sentence. This is known as Braunwald's definition of heart failure. It states, a clinical syndrome caused by the inability of the heart to supply blood to the tissues sufficient to meet the metabolic needs of the tissue or only at the expense of elevated filling pressures. Diagnosis Making an accurate and thoughtful diagnosis of congestive heart failure requires the synthesis of information gathered in clinical history, the physical exam, and diagnostic testing. Let's begin with clinical history. Clinical symptoms of heart failure can be thought of as falling into two categories. Symptoms resulting from volume overload and symptoms resulting from decreased cardiac output. Symptoms of volume overload include dyspnea on exertion, lower extremity edema, orthopnea, or a sensation of shortness of breath when lying down, often noted clinically when patients prop themselves up on multiple pillows to sleep proxismal nocturnal dyspnea, or a sensation of smothering that occurs while sleeping at night and classically improves with sitting up on the side of the bed, and hepatic congestion or ascites which may manifest as weight gain or increased abdominal girth. Symptoms of low cardiac output include fatigue, dizziness, and decreased mentation. Next we will review clinical exam features of congestive heart failure. A detailed clinical exam in a heart failure patient is helpful to not only establish the diagnosis of heart failure, but to also evaluate for the underlying etiology. Heart failure specific exam findings include an S3 gallop, an elevated jugular venous pressure, hepatojugular reflux, pitting extremity edema, abdominal ascites, and crackles on lung exam. Of these physical findings, an S3 gallop or hepatojugular reflux are both highly specific as shown. We will now discuss the utility of laboratory and diagnostic testing for a patient with suspected congestive heart failure. Basic laboratory work should be done to assess hematologic status, electrolyte levels, and renal function. However, in basic CBC and BMP testing, there are no abnormalities that are pathognomonic for congestive heart failure. Hyponatremia may be seen with volume overload resulting in hypervolemic hyponatremia. A troponin measurement is likely to be normal or demonstrate very low level elevation that is stable in serial measurements unless there is an active acute coronary event or active myocarditis. A serum BNP measurement has become the test of choice for diagnosing heart failure. Elevated BNP levels have a high sensitivity and specificity for a diagnosis of heart failure, especially when combined with additional history, exam, and other laboratory and diagnostic testing. A chest x-ray is a standard evaluation for a patient with shortness of breath. Chest x-ray findings in heart failure include bilateral interstitial infiltrates, pulmonary venous cephalization, curly B lines or fluid in the interlobular septa of the lung, cardiomegaly, or a pleural effusion. An echocardiogram is a very helpful test in a patient with suspected heart failure. Echocardiography gives a wealth of information on cardiac structure and function, including left ventricular size, left ventricular ejection fraction, and evaluation for valvular disease, and much, much more. Once the diagnosis of heart failure has been made, attention should then be paid to establishing the etiology of the cardiomyopathy. Given the frequency of ischemic cardiac disease, this often begins with an assessment for ischemia with either nuclear perfusion testing or coronary angiography. Further testing for causes of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy are beyond the scope of this module. Treatment Treatment of congestive heart failure can be broken down into the acute and chronic therapies. 
In the acute setting, treatment with loop diuretics helps reduce volume and alleviate symptoms. After load reduction with ACE inhibitors or nitroprusside in patients with cardiogenic shock helps to improve cardiac output. In the event of severe heart failure or cardiogenic shock, inotropes like milrinone or dibutamine may be required to augment cardiac output. The chronic treatment of congestive heart failure can be understood well if we review the flow charts previously discussed in the section on pathophysiology. Beta blocker therapy has been shown to improve mortality in patients with congestive heart failure. Carvedilol, bisoprolol, imatoprolol succinate, or toprol XL have all been shown to improve mortality. Beta blockers block the effect of the sympathetic nervous system and prevent increased heart rate, which can then lead to further myocardial damage. ACE inhibitors like lisinopril decrease the production of angiotensin II and thereby block its detrimental downstream effects. Spironolactone or aplorinone block the effects of aldosterone and prevent sodium retention and improve mortality in patients with advanced stage heart failure. Hydralazine and nitrates used in combination decrease afterload and have also been shown to improve mortality in patients with heart failure. Device-based therapies with implanted defibrillators and biventricular pacing are also a standard component of comprehensive care for a heart failure patient. The specifics of these therapies is beyond the scope of our module. In very advanced stages of heart failure, cardiac transplantation or left ventricular assist device are therapeutic options and may be considered in very select patients. As well, in advanced stage heart failure patients, Referral to ho for hospice care may also be considered. Additional reading. <laughs>